Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today, we are going to be talking to Allison Bucky, and we're going to be talking about her book, Setting Boundaries with Your Adult Children. Oh, my gosh. All of us need this so desperately, especially my generation that is raising um, these millennials that are running about. <laughs> so I cannot wait to talk to you about this book. So welcome, Allison. Thank you, CJ, for having me. You know, I, um, I was reading this book and thought, Oh, no, that's me. <laughs> and, then, and then I was reading the stories of what could happen, you know, if if you continue enabling or helping your kids in ways that you think are helpful, but that aren't helpful um, in the long run, you know, your kids could end up in prison on drugs, like all these different kinds of things. They just become disempowered. I mean, I, that seems like an, an, an extreme example but i think when you don't empower your kids it's uh it's a problem so i do things for my sons both of them um in the spirit of helping and uh and so i started investigating these things and after this book i was just sending emails <laughs> to my children because <laughs> my son is off to college i'm like we're gonna have to talk about your budget and your finances and putting together all of that and then I had a conversation with him. Yeah, this is like literally while I'm reading your book. So I had a conversation with him yesterday because he's leaving for college in two weeks. And I figure I only have a little window to get all my parenting messages and boundaries in. And I said, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to be looking at a budget. And we're going to phase in your, your um, financial independence because that's ultimately what we want you to be. So we're going to, you're going to, you know, we'll pay for your tuition and we'll pay for your food and board, but anything above and beyond that is something that you're going to have to pay. And then over time, we're going to continue, you're going to be pay we're going to be paying less and less, and you're going to be paying more and more just so he has a ramp. So he's like not hit over the head <laughs> with this surprise. And that's I said, nice. that's a wise choice you're yeah. making. Isn't and it was interesting because I said, what do you think? He's like, well, it sounds logical. And I said, it's because we want you to be financially independent. And there are a whole bunch of skills that you have to pick up between now and then. And then there are a whole bunch of responsibilities. And, you know, now that you're entering, he's, in, he's going to a very competitive school. So, we like, you know, we want to make sure you focus on your grades. That's most important. But we're going to phase in very slowly this financial independence. And then uh, we'll give you money. You can start f playing around with the stock market. Like, we'll give you stuff so that you can be financially independent. And that felt so good, and that wouldn't have happened unless I had read your book. So oh, thank you. Your, it's a pleasure. Did you set consequences, though, if he doesn't do some of these uh, things? Yes, those are, those are actually written, and I've sent it to my husband, because as you say in your book, you need to actually make sure that you create a united front with your spouse, because if my sp husband's, like, you know, slipping money with, to him on the side, that's not going to be helpful. So um, I, I'm all so about plans. Smart. You're so smart. Well, you're, smart. you're, he you're healthy parents. Good for good. You. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing. Um, I think I'm actually a pretty good parent, but even a pretty good parent can make, you know, can still help in ways that are not helpful ultimately for a kid. And so uh, we'll be talking about some of the um, stories in your book, but I think that any kind of parent could be helped by this book because we are of a generation where. I don't know. I think we're having kids later. So for me, like I have my kid on, on the kind of later side, but now it's probably pretty typical. And so when that happens, it's so hard to have a kid, right? Like people are doing in vitro, they're doing all sorts of things to have a kid. So your kid is like this precious diamond. And so you're going to do everything to make sure that this miraculous child that was born and was really hard to conceive is going to get everything that they need. And we are also, my parents, I'm a, I'm a product of a 19, you know, 50s kind of parent where like I was pretty much like, like left to fend on my own and actually always harmed in that way because I was just like, I never knew what I was doing, but then I grew up to be independent. Right. So it's a, it's a mixed thing. So, but as a result, our, my generation over parents. So we're going to talk about your sanity process. Um, so, uh, it's a, it's a six step process that's based on the word sanity and, uh, <laughs> and I love it. So the first one is stop negative behavior. So tell me what that is. Well, it's negative behavior is different for, for everybody. So you know, it is, is your negative behavior as a helicopter parent? Are you hovering? Are you, are you 
finding yourself being responsible for things that are not your responsibility. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things we have to stop. And, and again, it's, it's individual for all of us. I say one of the big stops is stop the flow of money. Because you, you you talked about that earlier, about the the balance of of money. But you know, my generation, I'm when I'm a baby boomer, and a lot of us come from a a, a spirit of of things were a lot harder for us economically. So as mm. we got older and and made more money and had more opportunities, you know, we just wanted our kids to have more. Mm. You know, we wanted them to have the things we never had. Mm. So it's, you know, so we you know, in in that spirit of generosity and kindness and what we thought is love, you know, we just gave and gave and gave. So for a lot of us, we have to stop the flow of money. Mm. The stop step is key, but it's, again, it's different for everybody. For me, it really was stop the flow of money. I had a son who was a heroin addict mm. uh, and it was h- horrible. It's l- life with a, an addicted child is, it's a never ending uh, stream of insanity mm. and, and chaos, the drama, chaos, and crisis. And I was always coming to his rescue, bailing him out and writing a check for this, finding, you know, a, an attorney. It was it was a never-ending flow of money that I mm-hmm. was starting to hurt me. I mean, I couldn't afford this. So mm-hmm. I got to that point where I thought, well, this is, you know, I've got to stop. Mm-hmm. Stop. So for, for, for all of us, that stop step, we have to really identify what that is in our lives. Mm-hmm. Is it stop making excuses? Um, is it stop stop that you know handing out money behind your spouse's back? There's a lot of issues with spouses not not communicating when you've got an adult child who's challenging, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's really where this book is for. It's not just it's, uh, adult children are parents and children are always going to have challenges in relationships. It's learning to you know right. learning to communicate. Yeah, there's, there's it's it's relationships are, are hard and and sometimes some are harder than others. Yeah, <laughs> but this. I really wrote this for parents who are dealing with kids who are real. Uh, it's, it's a very dysfunctional relationship, whether they whether it's drugs or alcohol or or they won't work, can't work, don't want don't want to work. Uh, you know, it's it's those situations that really tax us. Mm-hmm. And, and the, here's what I thought was so fascinating when you were. I wrote down. I kind of try to summarize all the reasons because I thought this was very insightful, and I don't think people often realize is you said well you have to stop the enabling, but the question is what is driving that enabling? And so you had said for you what was driving that enabling was you know your 19 you know like wanting to, for as a baby boomer wanting to give it all you know like paying for attorney fees and such. And for me, I had different because I because I the question I asked myself, and I think is a critical question that you ask the readers in your book to question, is you said so why are you know what is driving that? And there's probably something in your family of origin or upbringing or life experience that's necessarily driving. And you have a list, so it's fear of being rejected or not appreciated by your children. And so what does that look like when you talk to folks? Like what does it sound like so that you can go, oh no, that's me. How would we self-identify ourselves as this person? It's fear and guilt. You know, there's, there's a lot of guilt there. There's fear, guilt, shame. There, what motivates us? And it, it's going to be, again, different for all of us. And really identifying that and looking at that and shining the light on us right here. Us. Yeah. We can't right. change anybody but us. You know, and, right. and many parents who are having challenges setting boundaries for their adult children are trying so hard to fix that adult child. Right. You know, fix him or her. Let me change them. Let me help them, you know, become better, whatever it is. Let me get them off drugs. Let me, you know, and they don't, they're not shining that light here. I had to look at myself. Yes, my son had a lot of challenges, but you know what? It was how I was responding to them that I could change. (laughs) I know this is kind of a rude way of describing us, but you know, the, um, there's that dog whisperer or there's a dog trainer and his, and I don't even have a dog. I've never even had a dog. (laughs) But what I've heard about the dog is often if you have a misbehaved dog, it has to do with the owner. And so the the trainer works a ton, mostly with the owner and trying to show the owner how to work with the dog so that it can be the leader of a pack, right? So the same kind, I mean, this is, kind, it's a rude analogy, but I'm oh, just... That makes sense. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique analogy, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because it is how we are responding and, and what, you know, what buttons our kids are used to us pushing. Or, yeah. Or, so, you know. But but I've seen this kind of like, oh, if I tell my child, I, you know, he can't get the blah, 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 the fancy blah, 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 maybe he won't like me or, you know, so this whole fear of rejection or not being appreciated, I thought was that was so 
clear or fear of what will happen if you don't provide, which was what you were talking about. Like if you don't pay the lawyer fees, then his whole life will be over, right? Because he'll be in prison well, and all these things, right? My son spent a lot of time in jail. Uh, and after, when I stopped bailing him out, I had to really realize though, CJ, he was spending time in jail, not because I didn't pay to bail him out. He was spending time in jail because of something he did, because of uh, right. action that he, it's a consequence to his action. Right. So, you know, that, Guilt for me to say, and I talk to a lot of parents that deal with that particular issue is, is incarceration right. or right. addiction. You know, that they, they feel if we don't pay, they're going to overdose or they're going to they're going to die. And these are realities and they're painful right. realities, right. which is very sad, very, very sad. See, that would be uh, so hard if you had a child in prison and you know that you know what the I don't know. I've just seen like reality TV shows or movies about prison, but it doesn't sound pleasant. And so you're trying to spare your child from that. But as you said, it's a consequence of choices that they made. Um, it would be so hard to stop. Huh? It's very hard for us. And, and when we've done this for so many years, uh, we've already you know, built this dysfunctional relationship. So being able to stop and step back from that and rebuild. You know, I believe that, that every relationship, it's possible to, to, to rebuild them. Now, what that rebuilding looks like, it might not be that you're, you know, very close and you see each other all the time. But there's ways to, you know, to heal some of these relationships that have challenges from right. from these poor boundary choices mm. that that we've made. But but it's, it's a process and it yeah. hurts. And yeah, I can imagine it would. And then you say another thing. Um, so the fear of, of uh, related to this, the fear of guilt in the event something happens to your child. Like, what if your child gets raped or killed or stabbed in prison? So did you go through that? And then also you talk about. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the guilt and what that looks like. What yeah, it looked like for you? Well, it's uh, you know the first time he was in jail, he was young. He was a teenager, uh, and and I was still you know legally responsible for him. So at the age range, you know, and I I. Bailed him out, got him into a rehab center, but that was just the start of it. It, it was a cycle. It kept happening and happening and happening the older mm. he got. So, mm. uh, and you know, I would always bail, either bail him out, but the bail got higher and higher and higher. Wow. <laughs> and, 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 and I was trying to see that there's obviously a pattern here and I'm not helping. My money and my bailing him out is not helping. And that, you know, getting through that guilt and that fear, um, is, is, is a tough is a tough thing. It's a daily, you know, for me, I'm a woman of faith. So for me, my faith helped me a lot to stand on. Right. But I just couldn't, I, I, I couldn't function, you know, continuing to bail them out. I was a single mom. I didn't have the money. I couldn't afford it. So, so it was, okay, I can do what I can do, you know, and I would put money on his books. You can help them so they can at least make some phone calls. And, you know, I had to set these limitations, you know, Chris, this is what I can help you with, but mm. this is it. <laughs> you know, mm. so, and, this is all I can do. And there were times when I couldn't, couldn't do any, you know, anything. And he right. spent a lot of time in jail. And, but over the years, I, I you know, I, I had to learn that this, it wasn't my choices. It's not my choice why he's there. Now my, the choice I make is how I can s still parent and be a mother to someone incarcerated. What, what does that look right. like? How many and times did you bail him out? Oh my gosh. Oh, I, I could be like maybe half a dozen. Wow. Maybe half. And how much does it cost to bail someone out? Depends on what the. It depends on. I know what you the, said it's scaled up, but I mean, in yes. total, did you spend? You no. Know, what 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 the issue is? You know, bail, bail is ten percent of whatever the bond is. So, oh. you know, his last his last um his last jail it was prison, wasn't jail, was a five hundred thousand dollar bond, which would <gasps> had to come up with fifty thousand dollars, which I I wouldn't even if I had it, I wouldn't have have done it at that wow. point. Wow. So wow. It, it just it's like seriously, I mean, what's you know, and and then prison's a very big money industry here, CJ. But that's a whole that's a whole other story there. But but you know, a lot of our kids are uh, are making poor choices that are related, you know, with drugs and the people that they're around, the company they keep, and they, you know, they find themselves in these situations that, you know, it's 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 it's, it's unfortunate. And mm -hmm. yeah, prison is you know system is filled filled with them. And how and how do we as parents? And there's a lot of organizations now that are helping. Uh, parents of incarcerated individuals, helping them also in their transition back, you know, back into society. Right. That's, a, that's a whole other, you know. Yeah, and that's a, that's a second step, but I want to cover a couple other things, because I think that the key thing, at least in my line of work and, and helping people, is that you have to understand where you fit within this and what's driving. And I think you talk about um, 
you talk about the guilt and perceived failures as a parent, and I don't know if you felt that as a single. I know that a lot of single parents think, oh, it's because I got divorced or I'm raising as a single parent, so I need to do more because there's a little bit of guilt, like perhaps I was responsible for this. Was there's that not a little bit? There's not a little bit of okay. guilt. Just a lot of guilt. <laughs> okay. Was that was that part of your equation for your own experience? Yes, it was. And when I talk to a lot of parents today, that's that that's especially single parents. We're we're trying to. You know, come in and, and be two parents, and, and and especially when you're working, you don't have the time to spend with them. So it right. was, uh. and I provided out of guilt and fear, not of a genuine, you know, love, but I just didn't understand that I was handicapping and not helping. Right. You know, and that's you know, that's and those are our issues. For me, it took I I had to go to therapy. I you know I, I I'm very pro therapy. You've got to talk to people. I right. came from a very dysfunctional family. I had a lot of abuse in my history and my background. So I had to really deal with the, my motivators. What what motivated me to respond the way I was responding to him and really look again, shining that light on ourselves. Why do we do what we do? You know what what what, what why am I operating out of that painful place? I have to heal so I can be. A healthy parent to him and that was the whole process of, of me trying to heal and grow and find sanity because it wasn't it wasn't easy you know, but mm. it, it's an intentional focus when we know things are out of kilter in our lives and we don't want to live that way anymore mm -hmm. so identifying something's got to change and mm -hmm. yes my son had to change but that wasn't up to me to change him the something right. that had to change in my life was here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's often that case, right? Because, because if you became so that, as I understand the logic that you presented in the book, if you were actually had some um, abusive issues in your family, you're going to try really hard not to do those same mistakes or in whatever you perceive as mistakes that, that your parents made. And then as a result may actually create a different kind of dynamic, right? That may another hel unhelpful dynamic i can completely see that and i it's interesting too because for for me when i when you ask the question like what is driving your behavior for me it's a it's literally a cultural thing because in the asian culture there is this kind of the helicoptering we were like the original helicoptering parents our people tiger, tiger mom tiger mom yeah it's the original it's it's kind of it's it's a way that you show love and as you describe it it's a misguided sense of love but it's culturally what I saw my parents do. And therefore, I do the same thing because I, you can only do as much as what you th see your parents doing and, and think this is love. They, they told me, this is how I love you, is to make sure that I'm helping you in every step of the way. And so for me, it's a cultural thing. But I can see for others, you also... Um, bring up a great point which I would never have thought about is you said you're influencing your child against another parent so I can see so if you got divorced and you have a, a spouse that you're trying to prove like I'm the nicer parent because look at all the things I'm doing for my kids I've seen my friends do this is yeah. that what you were talking about in this situation that happens to a lot now my my, my ex-husband was not in the picture at all but there's a lot of parents where that dynamic does fall in and then right. the parents it, their issue they're 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 going behind each other's back and and these and children are I don't care how old they are they're they're smart they're wise they can see this they can see which parents buttons they can push they can see how far they have to push that and they're used to that you know you get you get you, you develop a pattern and and that pattern is hard to break not mm -hmm. impossible but hard <laughs> yeah I'm, I was wondering because I have a friend who has a child who um you know, the husband cheated on her, they got divorced, so there's clearly a lot of bitterness and kind of issues with both the children and the wife. And the wife was always the one who created boundaries, and the husband was not. And so when the son goes over to the wife's house, he has a clear boundary environment. When he goes over to her husband's house you know he come he shows up to late late for school sometimes if he's like dad I just don't feel like going to school do I have to they end up not going to school like all these different kinds of things so when you have a, a different parenting style in a divorce situation like that one what would you do because you can't you could maybe stop yourself but you're working with a spouse that doesn't stop how would you deal with something like that in the stop scenario it, and a lot of that depends on the child's age. If they're a minor, you know, if, if they're a minor and you've got custody, that's a whole different issue, you know, in, in dealing with that. But if these children are over 18, 
it's up to them where they're going to want to go. They're eventually, they're, most of them are going to want to go with the easy parent. Cause that's, you know, it's like, right. Let's go with dad. Cause I can stay up late yeah. and not go to school and he'll pay me money and I can hang in his apartment. Like, and, it's, and, if, and if mom has to deal with that, that's what mom has to deal with because it's not her choice at that point. You know, yeah. she can love and, and, and stay strong in her resolve and, and share share that with each other. This is, you know, little little, little, little Johnny. <laughs> you know, this right. is, I, I love you. I don't believe in parenting that way. I don't think it's helping you, um, but it's your choice if that's where you want to live. But when you're home here, this is, not, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in that. And then to stick with that resolve, not to want to, you know, do yeah, like, oh, I know dad says that I'll do that every now and then just so you'll stay with me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a dynamic and that's where the parent, you've got to be strong to, to shoulder that and say, you know, for me, sanity is, is stopping this enabling behavior and, right. and, and, and your dad is choosing to do that and I can't stop him and I can't stop you, but you know, it just, it's come from that place of honesty and authenticity. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, again, I keep saying it's hard, but, because it is. There's no other way to get around that. Yeah. Setting boundaries uh, like that are, are difficult. It's even harder when another parent is is just, is what's what's the word um, sabotaging you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then also there's this kind of so I can imagine in that scenario that you know the the wife's parents may be like, why aren't you doing something more to you know or or like even in the case that you actually that your own case when you're talking about your book you're talking about. Uh, what, during one of the hearings, you actually knew the judge that was, you know, so it's this kind of like, what will others think? You know, here's a dear friend of yours. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that's my son that's actually being, you know, brought into prison. How do you deal with the guilt and shame of others? Because there's kind of this, oh, you must have done something wrong with your parenting. That's kind of pre-presumed in, in that case. Well, and you can't you can't change their presumptions. All, and all you can do is, is operate out of your you know, your your authentic space and your caring space. And in that itch situation, I lived in a very small town at that time. Everybody knew everybody. Right. You know, my my, my husband was a sixth generation in that town. Oh Every, gosh. And and my my son moved there and got in trouble and got arrested. So it was. I mean, the bailiff, the judge. I knew them all. The, the oh, arresting. Gosh. Person, knew so now but they knew us they knew me they knew you know and you know they they I didn't feel that they were judging me on that because they knew me when someone you know but you know there there are situations where people do point the fingers well, oh it's the parents fault that this child you know opened fire in a school which mm-hmm. is a horrible situation to talk about but that's you you hear that you know what what happened to that parent to make that child do that and it's I, I wouldn't say that the parent made that child do that. You know, they have their choices and what choices they're making. Yes, do we influence some of them? Yeah, we do. You know, and, and the younger they are, the more we influence them. So that's so why if you can get, you know, if you can set healthy boundaries and these kids are young and right. be consistent, be consistent with it. Um, it's it's going to make a world of difference. You know, by the time they're 18, 20, 30, you know, we've set some real strong patterns. You know, right. You know, that that right. we've got to break. So, so they get, it's a never ending. And so, so the next is like, once you do stop, so, you know, there was a point where like, I can't pay $500,000 in bail, so I have to stop. So how do you, do you communicate that with your son so that he understood like the gig is up, like all this past behavior, it's stopping now. So what did you say at that time when you decided well, to stop? Well, he understood years before that even that that that, that 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 gig had stopped. He knew I wasn't bailing him out anymore. So you know he would let me know if he was in jail, if he was, you know, what was going on, and I you know I would talk to him and let, let him call me on the phone, and I put I would put money on his book so he could have some money to call me, and that was it. He knew the bailing out had stopped years well, ago. What was the conversation that you had with him, and what was his initial reaction when you first told him I'm stopping? Okay. He, and he was he was a very understanding. He said, I know you don't have money, mom. You know, and he never he, he was a he is a unique child that he never came to me and says, would you would you pay for me? Would you bail it out? Would you give me this money? I always offered. I would always take care of it. And when I got to the point where I couldn't anymore, I said, Chris, I just can't do it. And he said, Mom, I, I understand. I, I get it. I, I understand. I mean, I, I, I'm here for my own reasons. I, it's my fault. Wow. So he, he owns he owns his. You know, he's never blamed That's me for that. That's interesting. Uh, now, not all, you know, not all um, adult children are like that. Um, but you know, he, he, you know, he said, I, "I get it. I get it that you can't afford that." 
Mm-hmm. And it was where it was at. But there's a lot of parents, you know, that it's not the same situation or their mm-hmm. child blames them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they feel even more guilt. Yeah, you know? like, why aren't you, don't you love me? How come you're just letting me here rot in jail? Then what do you say in well, those cases? Love, love is not spelled M-O-N-E-Y. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I do love you, but it's not about spending the money to bail you out. Yeah. Wow, that would just be such a hard conversation. Hard, hard. Yes, yeah. And then um, before we moved on to the A in the sanity, what's the difference for people who, because I think this is a hard thing, and, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm spending so much time with the stop is because I think that's probably the hardest thing for us to do initially is to just stop. Um, so the um, helping versus enabling, because I think oftentimes it's out of the a good intention to help that parents are doing these things. But what's the difference between parent uh, helping and enabling and being codependent if people aren't familiar? Because I still don't really understand what codependency is. <laughs> Can you educate me? Oh, well, well, see, helping, I say, is, is doing something for someone that they are not capable of doing for themselves. Hmm. Enabling, enabling is doing something for someone that they are capable of doing themselves. Uh... I, I use this analogy a lot uh, with parents that I'm talking to. Picture your child at three, four years old. Four, five. When do they learn how to tie their shoes? Four or five? Yeah, um, four or five, yeah. So, so they're learning how to tie their shoes, and they finally get this down, and they can tie their shoes. It's so great. They can tie their shoes. But mom or dad, because they're either in a hurry or they've got to get this done or that done, continues to tie them. And the child says, oh, I don't want to do it. You tie my shoe, mom. And then you tie, and, and then it's like, well, I don't need to you know, tie it. Mom's always going to tie it for me. They might have to mm. fall down over some laces that are hanging out and, and realize and feel that bump of falling down. And then they'll start tying their shoes. That's a oh. very, very basic way of explaining it's a perfect it. example, but that's what it, and what does codependency mean? It's well, we're fulfilling. This is our, our own issues. It's, it's fulfilling something. It's taking care of something that we're having a problem with. If we are feeling guilt or shame or anger, we are, you know, we, we get caught up into their addiction or their poor choices. It's about two people who now are now dysfunctional together, you know, and 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 get caught in that mire of of responsibility of what you know you're confused about what they're responsible uh, for i see so the co and then dependent is mean like you're you're dependent on each other yes my my for me i had this issue with wanting to take care of him and i was guilty and f- fearful of that he had an addiction and, and challenges in his life so i would try to you know fix him and he would you know you know be very appreciative when i would you know help bail them out these you know but but we were all just tied up back and forth back oh right forth. so like you're trying to heal yourself and the traumas that you may have experienced when you were younger and so you're depending on him to help you heal him he's dependent upon you to help him so that's the codependency exactly oh. it's in a very in a very root rudimentary form yes okay uh, now, yeah, because it, it is. We just we, we're feeding off of each other. Our our our, our weaknesses, our illnesses, our our. Oh, I had no idea because I've heard the term used over and over, and I'm like, mm-hmm. like, and then I realized at a certain point, I'm like, I don't even know what that word means. Okay, and then sometimes they actually have a little. I've some. I showed someone that showed me a triangle once with codependency. Have you ever seen that one? That's that's the AA and and narco, narco, narcotics anonymous symbol. Is the triangle? Oh no, so, but they like talk about three parties. So who's the third party in the? There's you, your your child, and then is there a third party involved or no? Is that what the triangle's about? No, no, I think it's just the symbol for. for okay, a, a, okay, we'll a, skip that. A, All right, so let's go go to the next part, which is assembling a support group. So we talked about S sanity, your your six step model. The first is stop. The yes. second is assemble a support group, and you talk about AA Codependence Anonymous, which I didn't even realize was an organization, <laughs> which is nicknamed CODA, and then you have your own group of, of folks that are a part of a, a group. Tell us about how, how, how these groups help, what you can get out of that experience of going to AA or Codependent Anonymous or the group that you're part of, uh, that you've created. Sandy support group. And assembling supportive people doesn't necessarily mean group. Groups, A group environment is very, very helpful. But it could be one person. It could be a counselor. It could be a therapist. When we're caught up in the insanity of poor boundaries, it's hard to be objective. It's very hard. So you know, often we need someone that help, you know, that we trust to help shine that light on us and 
hold us accountable, uh, you know, care for us, you know, lovingly, talk to us, communicate with us, and build that that uh, rapport and that relationship. Because so often when when you're, you're a parent who's dealing with issues like this, we isolate. Let's get away. We, we don't mm. want to be. We're, we're, we're either so ashamed or guilty of what's going on, or we think we're alone. You know, my son was involved in drugs, you know, very, very young. And I was sure I was the only parent that was dealing with this at that time. So you didn't hear a lot about it. Mm. So it was only when I started talking about it and getting around other people that I realized I wasn't alone. Mm. So that component about, you know, it's vital to have supportive people. So whether it's a support group for yourself, um, for the relationship issue that you have. Uh, the, the second book in this series was is um, Setting Boundaries with Your Aging Parents. Now, mm. there's a lot of groups of people, you know, now that have the sandwich generation where they're, they're raising young kids and they also now have their parents. So, there, you know, there, there's there's issues there and there's now support groups for that. You can be around other people so you're not alone. You right. know, we just... We need to be in, in, in healthy environments, though. There's also, you know, some c- kind of wacky, crazy groups out there. So you've got to, you know, you've got to be right. very cautious in the groups that you get involved in. But um, having advice and encouragement and listening and praying and just how, however that dynamic looks for you, uh, that it, that is critical. You know, and yeah. these sad steps came from my walk with this. You know, with my son, I didn't. I, I was alone, and and I was realizing I. I can't do this alone. For me, it started with the therapist, with the counselor, mm. and then it was a, a support group, and then it was, you know, it, it just kind of grown from there. And then the sanity steps. I have sanity support groups where we're just trying to, you know, get strong and set healthy boundaries in all of our relationships, not just. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm hearing that the that the things that you get out of support group um, in a bigger group, because not everyone can afford going to a therapist. That's expensive, right? right to do well, one-on-one therapy. Scale, I, was, I, I always found one on a sliding scale. Oh, that, wow. that, they, they can be expensive, but there's there's church support. Group. There's, a, there's a lot if you search. Okay, search so for- let's actually say if you want it, let's go from the smallest to biggest, because I'm kind of, and, and I don't really understand if you don't have a lot of resources as a single mom. I mean, it, it may have been hard for you. So how did you... So you talked about sliding scale, but what other, you could go to churches, it sounds like. That's and so church. it's like, what el- what other resources, if you just don't feel comfortable yet talking in a group, what are the other resources that are affordable resources for folks who want to maybe get help? Well, and now we're, we're, we're talking on one of the most awesome resources today is online communication, is the ability to reach groups today. Uh, again, you've got to be judicious and cautious in, in, in what information you're sharing and, and, and the groups that are out there because there are so many of them, but you can go online and be, you know, a lurker and just listen to people talking about this issue. You know, you, there's support groups all over that you can get keyed into. And now it's, it's so, there's so many that we really have to be very, very cautious about what, you know, what we're getting involved in and look for referrals, you know, of, of, of groups that are, that are, uh, that are that are that are healthy groups actually that, you know. <laughs> okay I, I, i'm hearing a i'm hearing some stories behind that so tell me a yeah. little bit about what makes a healthy group <laughs> and what makes an unhealthy group because it sounds like there's a lot of stuff out there so you have to be a, a careful shopper oh absolutely if you get if you're on an online group and somebody's telling you you should do this or you should do that or they're trying to guilt you into something that's not a, a healthy group it's not being run by a moderator who uh, you know, who, who can control this because it's not about because you can get yourself into another co- codependent group. You know? Oh, <laughs> my goodness. They're, they're blaming you and they're saying, well, you should do this, you should do that. The goal, what is your goal? The goal is to grow. The goal is to become whole people. The goal is to help mm. our hearts, you know, find that healing, loving place and be able to respond to people that push our buttons, you know, in, in, a, in a healthy way. So if you're in a group or an environment where you aren't, you know, nobody's holding anybody accountable and they're just you know, pointing fingers and it, that's unhealthy. So it's got to be a, a group that is encouraging you to ask yourself the important questions, mm. you know, it, it's, inc- it's helping you um, identify why you are responding the way you are, you know, why, why, and that's, that, that's what sanity is about is it's about, Finding, you know, what what what's what is our weak point and how do we make it stronger? Not has having somebody blame me or tell me what I should do or shouldn't do or you know, people that are boundary challenged can be. And believe me, I know I'm the most boundary challenged person I know. So, so to be writing this series is amazing to me. I'm learning every step of the way. You know, but we're either steamrollers or we're doormats. 
Oh, the, wow. Interesting. So it comes in two different it, forms. It kind of seems to be door, doormats or, or, or steamrollers trying to control everything. You know, those, um, those, those, those helicopter tiger parents, you know, they're, I'm going right. to control everything. You get to do this, this, and that control becomes so overwhelming. You can't control everything like that. Uh, so, you know, with, with boundaries, we've got issues. It's mm, <laughs> I see. So, so, you, so, like, if if you are a doormat parent or steam, like, do you think that steamroller parents like the steamroll to be amongst other steamrollers, or no one likes steamroller parents? So, just it's not helpful. I don't know. It's it depends on the again. It's that it's that, that codependency thing. If if a, if a doormat parent really needs somebody to be telling them what to do, they they may function, but that's a code code unhealthy right. Code right. relationship. Uh, that's how you're because that person is is now relying upon that door. The steamroller meets doormat is not necessarily a good scenario because then you become codependent on playing your story okay. with each other. Oh my gosh, I didn't even get that until you just said that. Wow. You know, the emotional, the emotional, you know, psychological issues that we're dealing with are 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 pretty significant for for people who really are boundary challenged. But but once you back out of that and get a, 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 you know, supportive people, whether that's a therapist or a group, and you start looking at yourself and really identifying and, and looking at your own issues in a, from an honest, authentic place yourself. You know, when, you're, uh, when, you, know, okay, when you hit okay. your own bottom and you, and you say, okay, you know, I need to look at, at this uh, and in a healthy way and then, and then replace, you know, these actions with something different. I see. You know? So I'm hearing like if you wanted to join an on group, online group, look for the following one so that has a moderator mm -hmm. two is an environment where it's about self-inquiry and self-discovery versus kind of a punitive judging kind of situation yeah. because that's how you heal right you need to be in a loving supporting encouraging group so if you look and you see those is kind of the posts and you're like aha this is a place that i can go to heal where because people encourage me they support me they uh empower me by asking me questions versus telling me what to do so that's exactly. one exactly. yeah so kind of look at the groups and see so then and, and then referrals, too. referrals seem very good you know, ask people that you trust you know whether it's a, a teacher a pastor a, you know someone that maybe maybe your child's teacher you know some somebody right. that, that you trust that can refer you to a group and again there's a lot of sliding scale groups now today we are and there's a plethora of of help out there available you know right. back you know, decades ago when i was dealing with, like with this with my son there really weren't a lot of groups out there where you could even talk about this right so things that were, 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 were blessed that things have changed and the dynamic of being able to be transparent like that has changed mm -hmm. so people aren't as afraid as they used to be to share that they've got a drug addicted child or a child in prison or you know, right. what whatever these issues may be. Um, I've, I've got a parent now who I've been talking to. She has a daughter and her daughter is now pregnant with her fifth child, all by different fathers. Mm. And and now here's mom with her daughter pregnant with baby five. And this mother is just going crazy saying, now, I mean, what do I, what do I do? How can I, I mean, I, I've got, I'm taking care of two of the kids here. One is over there. It's just a nightmare situation for her, but she's talking it through, and and we're and we're getting help for her, and she's you know she's walking the steps and 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 trying to deal with this. But years ago, you, nobody talked about that kind of thing. Mm, yeah. So, well, I think it's a thing that you that you said initially when we were talking about this second step is that you're alone and you feel embarrassed and you feel shame, so you just want to suffer in silence. But really, if uh -huh. you go to any group, whether it's a face to face group or an online group. You realize that actually you aren't alone, that what you're experiencing is totally normal. And then you probably get help and saying, here's, you know, here's, I started off at your stage and here's what I learned and here's the journey that I went. But at least you have probably lots of different strategies that people have used that they're there to help support each other during various stages of awareness of, of this issue. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I can see how that would be super helpful. I don't know if you feel comfortable. Are there certain groups that you, you have found yourself would refer that you think these are really great groups? Of course, your own group. And tell us how we find well, sanity groups. Well, and I'm, I'm starting sanity groups online now because we okay. used to have them all through, all through the country where people would, would hold their own. So if you want to start a sanity support group, there's a workbook uh, that, I, that is uh, the companion workbook to that book. Oh, great. It's a, 
and it and it shows leaders how to start their own group in their community, um, how you can two or three, four people, and 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 you go week by week. It's a twelve week group. Um, I'm going to start having them online though because I really want to be able to do this. I really want to reach out because this is a real issue for parents. Is is, is this enabling issue? Uh, but there's a great group called Mercy Heart for people who are dealing with incarcerated children. Mm-hmm. It's one of the best organizations in this country. It's called Mercy Heart, and they will minister and talk to you, you know, as, as a parent, you know, to walk through how you can best help your child or spouse. It could be spouse. Mm. There's a lot of you know, spouses that are in jail. Now here, now here's mom or dad raising kids while the other parent is in jail. So there's there's that that dynamic is hard. And then when they're 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 transitioning the inmate is transitioning out of prison back into society, it's a whole different world that they're dealing with now. So that group helps in that dynamic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mercy Heart. Get, Mercy Heart. And then and and they have a great online business uh, online communication too. But you know AA Narcotics Anonymous, Codependency Anonymous, those are those are three really big groups. And the the um, Association of Christian Counselors has some great counselors around that are that actually the American Association, any counseling association has sliding scale counselors. So you can go on find out those. Uh, but that that A is, is critical. It is critical because we aren't alone. And it, the sooner we can breathe, you know, stop. That's that's yes, stop. Blaming yourself, stop being afraid, and speak up. Speak up. Find you know, connect with the group. Yeah. Share share that hurt, and you're gonna you're gonna start that transition, that road. Yeah, and what's I think find interesting because of the resources that whether it's AA or codependence or not, you know, co- other organizations is that it, you may not necessarily have a you may not have a coda in your town, but you may actually have an AA. So. Because all of them probably are there to support and love the people who attend and to encourage. So even though you're like, my kid's not an alcoholic, you know, they're a heroin addict or they have these other kinds of issues. You could probably, is that fair to say that you could go to one of these events because they have the supportive space that's there for you. So even though you may not resonate with the exact stories or you can go to a therapist that may not have specific information about your specific problem just focusing on yourself first is exactly. the first thing, it's, right? It's, exactly. And cel- Celebrate Recovery is another great organization. That's mm-hmm. uh, ce- Celebrate Recovery. Uh, and that's that's more of a faith-based background to it. It's a, it's a, a 12-step program. Mm-hmm. This is 12 steps. It's like AA uses 12 steps. Celebrate Recovery does. It's it's just, it's groups that are, there's a lot of dynamics in, in that in that particular group, whether they're dealing with kids or yourself with um codependency or addiction or, or addiction to pornography or financial ruin or, you know people is you know there's there's Spend too much yeah us. yeah there's, so there's a lot you know and that there's a lot of those people that attend those people I don't say it that way but uh, celebrate recovery really speaks to a broad category mm. there's a lot of groups out there uh, it's just being able to be transparent enough in your own space you know to reach out and admit this and feel safe you know mm. and, and Stop, mm-hmm. stop hiding, stop, stop being alone in your pain. So that's right. why that stops and get, I encourage people to get p- paper and pencil out, you know, and start writing down. What do you think you need to stop? It may take you a while. And then, and right. a, who do I, who do I have to assemble? Maybe I just need to talk to one person right now. Maybe right. I just need, you know, it's a, it's a growth process in our own lives. And, right. yeah. and we spend so long focusing on other people that we're trying to fix that we haven't looked at the person that needs fixing the most right which is yourself right yeah. yeah so i i i love it i think that that's great to actually be able to have all these different resources now i assume that also that the same rules apply i think if cuz i've i've had a friend who is an alcoholic or a friend of a friend who is an alcoholic and she had said that this gal went to like 3 or 4 or 5 different aa groups cuz she just couldn't find her group so there's a sense of when you go into these groups, what, because if you're in a big city, then you may have like a plethora of choices and then you have to decide. But I assume the same criteria that you use for online is like, is the moderator or the person facilitating actually providing a good, healthy, loving environment? Because if there aren't, then it's probably not a good healing space for you or whatever that may look like for you. Yeah, you're absolutely right, which is why some of those more well-known organizations that have very strict 
structure are, are going to be better because they there there's no cross talking in AA or or CODA or or Celebrate Recovery. They've got real strict formats that make them work. It's why the programs work. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, if it, if it, if you're not comfortable there, it's understandable. You might want to go to a few different groups, but. There also has to come that time where you're saying, why am I not comfortable? And mm. so is the problem me? And I'm just, I just want to blame the group environment. It's ah, this, that's a really good point. That, that, so it's their problem. This person did that, did that. And you're never then going to. Right. It's like trying to find friends. Like there's always something you find <laughs> about that person that you don't like. But really, if you're in a, what, what I think is so important about what you said is there's a structured environment where. And for people who aren't, because not everyone's familiar with the word crosstalk, but it's like when two people are talking at the same time and that there are kinds of probably rules of facilitation that a good facilitator that has been trained properly will create clear boundaries for the group. Because if you have a person who is facilitating that doesn't have clear boundaries, then, you know, that's, a, <laughs> and you're talking about boundaries. I, I've been in a couple support groups years ago, I mean, 20, 30 years ago that were just, you know, I, I found myself just shaking my head thinking, oh my gosh, if I wasn't, you know, insane when I walked in here, I sure will be walking out of here. <laughs> this is, this is crazy. Yes. Yeah. You know, but, but then you just move on and you, you and yeah. you, you find another one. But yeah. It's, it's a process. Growth is a process, and and finding the teachers that that speak to us are, is um, it, a lot of it is timing. If we're really ready, if we're really, and that's where and and nip excuses in the bud is the end step in sanity. You know, if yeah. we've got all these excuses for why things don't work. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to do it in the in the last couple minutes. I wanted to do some role playing. So your child says, "Oh, mom, I'm I'm too tired. I'm things are going to change. Um, you just don't understand my situation." Um, I promise that next time, now that you bail me out, I promise that things will be different. It's it's really, or or alternatively, it's not really my fault. It's because when I got caught in that situation, it was because I was with these friends, and then they did this. Thing. So 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 this is the the stories, excuses that happen. So um, I want to role play. So I'm going to be um, your child, okay? And I've and I've said and I've just said that dialogue. What would you say? I have to know if you're a child who is a minor or are you over 18? Because see, there is a distinction, CJ. Okay, what, so what, tell me, what if, if I'm a minor and I just told you that story, what would you say? And if I was an adult? You, you, well, that, that you have rules in, in my in my home and there, there, are, there are things that have to be done. And you go to school and there's no option for that. You know, and, and if you decide not to go to school, there, here's the consequences. There's grounding or the phone goes away or whatever whatever it may be then you've got to be clear but you know, mom with, it's my friend who told me to do that mom it's well, like it's i'm sorry i'm sorry that, that 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 your friend told you that but you have the ability to make a choice dear. it's not my <laughs> fault she she was forcing me oh she was forcing you she, she was she, forcing me to not go to school she's like was kind of, I'm going to make going to post all these things about facebook about how it's going to be a wimp if i didn't skip school and join the group to go to the beach well, and that and that's that that's a sad situation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that your friend is like that. And is how much of a friend is is she? If she's you know if, if she's saying these negative things to you about what she's going to be doing to you if you don't follow that, you know. And, and that situation is is going to be tough, CJ. Even even that scenario because you're talking about cyber. You're talking about not cyber. Right. You're, you're opening up a whole other can of worms over how this child feels about themselves. So it really is, you know, if, 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 if their identity cannot be tied up with other kids mm. so, so much, our young people's identity is, is things and people and, 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 and the stuff you have and how good your stuff is. And I mean, it's just, yeah, it, if it, I don't party, who, who am I going to be my well, friends? See, and that's why that identity has got to come from somewhere else. And mm. you've got to help that child have that strong self-esteem and identity younger, you know, so they can make these these kind of choices. Mm. It doesn't just all of a sudden happen at 16, 17 or 18. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a ramping up of, you know, a dependency and an identity and other stuff. And they're mirroring us, too. So if parents, you know, are so caught up and they are a lot of parents are caught up in their careers and money and and, and all they know is to dole out more money and they and they haven't really built this strong structure mm. identity mm. this child so that's a you know, that's a that's a whole other issue but to be able to you know help your children make strong wise choices is it's a boy it's a process and if you're at that point now where they're rebelling and then they're gone they're say you know say you're you're you as a parent have some real issues with how you're going to respond to this mm. you know if they're running away or what you know the, the options that they're taking have consequences but as a minor we also have 
consequences as parents. You can't just say, fine, go out and live on the street then. You don't want, you don't want to live by my rules, go. You can't do that for a minor. Oh. You, you, and many states are even different. You Why can, can't you be, do that as a minor? It's illegal. You can be arrested, can be arrested as, a, as, a, as a parent. Arrested out of what then? What would be I arrested for? It's what would here, I be? It's going to be either, depending on your state where you're in, you know, it's, it's reckless endangerment. It's mm. uh, um, neglect of a minor. It's, you know, again, they're all, they're all very, very different. Uh, encourage parents to call themselves, call yourself, call the um, Child Protective Services and ask them. And say I'm a parent. I'm having challenges with my child. I'm just trying to get to become a better parent. What are my options here when a child is, is, is continually true? It refuses to go to school. What can what can I do? Get help. That's that a get help. Ask somebody. Mm. You know, ask them what what are what are your rules here? I lived in a state where, where I you know, I told my son that he could not be in my house um, high. So if he came home high, don't come home. But it got it got to that point, you know. It was which is start, sounds horrible. He was like 17, but it was so I, I was I was overwhelmed at that time. I couldn't deal with this. Well, a police officer, you know, knocked on my door and said, y "Your son, you know, you can't tell him not to come home. You're, you're, he's a minor." Oh. It, it, so so it's like. Okay, this is interesting. Now, so it was a you know right it, because you're trying it, to create boundaries for the kid, but then the law doesn't allow you to. Wow. Well, and you don't like you know, and that was kind of a foolish thing for me. I was that was not a good choice for me to make. He's 17 years old, saying just don't. I was just frazzled at that point after yeah. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five years of it. He started running away from home at 13. I was oh, like, gosh. You know, I was frazzled. So, but I started from there growing and learning what can I do and can I do. So, when you get a scenario about a minor child, minor age, it's different, and it's a, there's a real distinction there. So, when when they're when they're beyond minor age, they're you know, 18, 19, 20, older. There's there's different criteria. You know, okay. you're, you're allowing them to live in your home by choice. Mm. You know, and there are certain rules at my home, and if you know, and it doesn't need to be a, a heavy-handed. But it needs to be consistent, and you've got to follow. Mm -hmm. Consistency is the thing. You know, there's, there's, you know, we, we say these things, then we don't follow through with the consequences. Who are listening now on the radio, go up to Fire It Up with CJ on YouTube, and you'll be able to hear the other steps. And then we'll start. I want to continue talking about what you would do with what well, if you have someone who's 18 and above, who's an adult, and how you would deal with that same scenario, and about consistency and follow through, which you just talked about. So, for those on the radio, thank you for listening, and thank you so much. This is so helpful. And for folks who want to go to your website, tell us is it do they go to Allison, your, your name, A L L I S O N? B O T T K E dot com or sanity support dot com. Yeah, they all feed into Allison dot com. Okay. There's, my, there's a new website there. And then we have a Facebook for sanity support group. Uh, it's a it's a private membership group. You just kind of log in to set set boundaries and find sanity. You can look for that one. There's a lot of us talking online about this issue of enabling and how to get stronger and be lo kind and loving parents and helpful, not hindering. <laughs> Yes, love it. Thank you so much. We're going to. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.